the true mirror of your destiny is not the physical mirror it is the word of god that is who you are hallelujah prophetic dimension of scriptures and i'll continue from a scripture i touched last week and i believe that is going to be of great help to us as i touch on this scripture second peter chapter 1 verse number 16 for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our lord jesus christ and were witnesses of his majesty for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard. When we were with him in the holy mountain. We have also a more sure. Word of prophecy. Somebody say, more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until a day dawn and the day star arises in your heart. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Apostle Peter gives us a background of his encounter and his own experience. And he says that when we speak of the coming of Jesus and the power of his salvation we do not just speak out of inspiration of cunningly devised fables in other words it's not a tradition we came to meet that we came to hear our forefathers preaching that Jesus will come and then we are also saying it he says that we were eyewitnesses on the holy mountain when the father of glory and power honored Jesus on the holy mountain of transfiguration. And we know it from Matthew 17. And he said, we heard the voice that said of Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He said, we heard it. And how many of them is he talking about? He's talking about James himself and John. He said, we had a deep physical encounter that the voice of God came down and testified about Jesus. So when we preach the second coming of Jesus and we preach the power of Jesus, we are not just adapting somebody's message. It's a witness that we had. And he said, on that mountain, we have strange encounters and that became the surety of our prophetic message that Jesus will come back again. Then he is quick to give us a hope and an assurance of our source of encounter he said but aside the divine encounters we have a sure word of prophecy that you do well if you pay heed that means that if you've never had a dream that Jesus is coming if you've never had a vision that a trumpet was sounding and angels were there if you've never had a hell encounter if you've never had a heavens encounter it's fine but he says that to those who have not had any encounter at all but depend on the prophetic message of scriptures. He said, you do well. That means that people who proud themselves that they, have, they saw hell, they saw heaven. If it's left to Apostle Peter, the one who has never had a vision, but have trusted that Jesus is coming because he read from scriptures. He said, that person do well. That's why Jesus said that blessed are they who have not seen but yet believe. And his, Apostle Peter gives us a depth of assurance in scripture 
And he said that no scripture has private interpretation. In other words, I'm so sure that those who wrote the scriptures did not write by their own strength. Some of the scriptures look funny. Some of them look like a lie. Some of them look like contradiction. But the truth of the matter is that nobody by his own understanding wrote the scripture. So every prophecy you see there, Apostle Peter is telling us today that it is the very inspiration of God. And if only it's a prophecy, then be rest assured that it will come to pass. So now the question lies on us. How do we understand this mystery of the prophetic message that scriptures carry? Knowing very well that the sure word of prophecy is not the encounter of the holy mountain. It's not what a prophet said he went into a place to see. It is what is written in scriptures. So the best the church can do for themselves is to begin to locate the prophetic messages of God in scriptures. And not just recite it, not just know it, but be convicted of it that it will surely come to pass. And I want us to talk about some prophetic messages that is a more sure word of prophecy that we cannot depart from it whether we do we, whatever happens those prophecies will come to pass because it is written in scriptures and we don't need anybody else to come and give us deeper details of it what we see in scriptures is a sure word of prophecy and i'll begin from what apostle peter began with we have not followed the cunningly devised fables concerning the coming of Christ. And we are not even depending on the prophetic encounter we had on the mountain. We are depending on what scriptures have said. So the question is that, how sure is the prophetic message of the second coming of Christ in scripture? Let us not be confused. If there are, there are messages that tells you that occupy till he comes, therefore, you are mandated to do business. You are mandated to possess all kinds of properties on earth. You are mandated to be yourself. You are mandated to be that. There is also a sure word of prophecy that the Bible says that you do well. And it's like light that shines in a room in darkness. And last week I explained to you that what it means is that when scripture is there, you don't care what is happening out there. It's a light to you even in darkness. And he's telling us today that we must pay heed to these prophetic messages. And what is that prophetic message? The first is the coming of our Lord Jesus. If you read Acts chapter 1, he said, when Jesus began to ascend, when Jesus began to ascend, he told them, when the Holy Spirit come upon you, you shall be witnesses of me, both in Jerusalem and all that. And the Bible says that they began to watch him whilst he ascended to heaven. And whilst he was captured into the cloud, Two men in white garments stood and told the disciples, Why are you gazing at him? This same Jesus that you see him go will come. And it was captured in scriptures. Whenever the challenges of life begins to shape us, and we are tempted to go outside scriptures, and we are tempted to misinterpret what prophecy is, let us remember that there is a sure word that will never change. And that word is that Jesus will come back again. It may be a time like this that we are here and I'm standing before you preaching. And suddenly that prophetic word will manifest. It may be a time when it's a Monday we are all about our businesses. Then suddenly this sure word of prophecy will happen. And it is not just once that scripture confirms his second coming. Jesus himself, in so many occasions, through parables. When you look at Matthew chapter 13, he said he spoke to them in parables. Because in hearing, they hear, but they do not understand. And they do not perceive. In seeing, they see, but they do not perceive. So he knew very well that when he comes with a clear message, we won't understand. So the Bible said he spoke to us in parables. And then he told his disciples, unto you is given to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. Then he calls them and begins to break down the parables to them. That means that the parables had more to do with the kingdom, the church, Christ, and everything that will happen before his coming. When Peter was talking about this, he was speaking of the Old Testament. But the Old Testament confirms 
everything about Jesus and his church until he comes back again and to the judgment and the destruction of the world. So even his parables, Jesus kept speaking of his coming again in his parables. And it's high time we understand that there is one subject that we must be convicted about. It's a prophecy that we'll never miss. And it's the coming of our Lord Jesus. Whether the church is flourishing or not, whether challenges, whether persecution is in or not, whether the church is prospering or not, there is one thing that is assured. There is a day coming that Jesus will come. And he tells us in Luke chapter 10, the, the good Samaritan. He said that there was a man who was captured in, uh, by thieves and was beaten half dead and naked. And he said, priests and Levites came and they passed by. And then a good Samaritan came and put him on a beast. And when he put him on his beast, took him to an inn. And then they poured oil and wine upon him and he paid for the inn. And he said, take care of him when I come back. That was the message of the gospel. The half dead man is us. The Levites and the priests is the system of the law whereby they, they were to sacrifice and atone for the sins of the people. And yet, it couldn't redeem the people from sin. So they were helpless before the wounds and the, and the death and the pain of the people. And then a good Samaritan in the name of Jesus comes and put us on his beast and take us to an inn, which is the kingdom of God. And we all know that without him, we cannot see the Father. It is through him we have access. So the beast is his grace. He takes us to the inn and pays for the inn. And that is how he paid for our sins on the cross. And then he tells him, pour wine and oil on his wound. And that is how we were given the gift of the Holy Spirit. To heal us from every wound. And he pays for our stay in the inn. That is the kingdom. And he said, take care of him. And we are to be taken care of until our wounds and our pain and our death is totally gone. And he said, I will come back again. And if I come and I need to pay more, I will pay. That means one sure thing is that he will come back. He has brought us into a kingdom. We have the Holy Spirit. That is why we must allow ourselves for the Holy Spirit to work on us. You came in as a sex addict. You came in as a pornographic addict. You came in as a drunkard. You came in as a crazy man. You came in as an angry man. You came in as everything. But he's giving you oil and wine. And the oil and wine must heal your wound. And make sure that he comes back to meet you. Clear and strong. But the prophetic, sure prophetic word is that I will come back. I didn't just pay to leave them there. The penalty and the cost of the cross was great. That is why we are being taken care of. We pray and we are healed. We pray and we, breakthroughs come. We pray. We are being taken care of. The Holy Spirit keeps working on us. Keeps working on our temperament. Keeps working on our weaknesses. Keeps working on that. But the real sure word of prophecy is that he will come back again to check whether his investment has yielded results. He will come. Look at the parable of the ten virgins. Ten espoused to a man. And he said, this man went. The groom was to come back again. And the ten virgins were asleep. And when the groom sounded, five of them had extra oil. Five didn't have. The fact that they were sleeping didn't stop the groom from coming. He still came. And it's a message to us that the time is coming. The sleeping there is not physical sleep. The sleeping there is a message that very soon we will all forget that he will come. And the virgins there, he's talking about us. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2. He says that I am jealous over you with the godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband. And as a chaste virgin to her husband. I have espoused you to one husband. And I have given you, waiting to present you as a chaste virgin. So we are the virgins Jesus was talking about. But the sure word is that he will come back again. But the, the question here is that will he come and find us sleeping? Yes, he may. He may come and find us sleeping. Oh, Jesus. And some of us will be careless enough that we will not even pick oil for a lamp to be burning. Listen, look at Luke chapter 19. He gave talents unto men. And some he gave ten. He said that a master went, gave talents to his servants. And went to a far country to be enthroned as a king and to return. And when he was living, he gave ten talents, five talents, one talent. And he said, some traded with it and get a double. Others buried it. He said, and when he came back, ah, Jesus will come back again. 
And the church, the early church understood this so deep that they were to follow the tradition of the Jews. When a Jew met a Jew, the greeting was simple, shalom, peace unto you. And that was the greeting of the early uh, Jewish system. That they meet one another and they say, peace unto you, shalom, peace unto you, shalom, peace unto you. But when the church appeared, the church was so focused on the coming of Jesus. Because at that time they were facing so much persecution. And they were being forced to make Caesar a lord. And everybody had to worship Caesar. But the early church said, we'd rather die than to worship another lord. And they had to change their greeting to Maranatha. The Lord is coming. Jesus is coming. And that was their greeting when two Christians meet Maranatha. Reminding themselves, focus that Jesus will come again. Don't bow to the Lord of the earth. Don't bow to the tribulation. Jesus will come back again. And that became their greetings. Just to remind themselves every day that the master will come. Hold on, the master will come. Hold on, Jesus will come. If you can't die, because it's worth it. They were conscious of it. Conscious of his coming. It is an error today that such a prophecy is being kicked into a basket. And we are not even sure of ourselves if Jesus will even come. And some of us have even forgotten the essence of our gathering. That it is to encourage ourselves every time we meet and to remind ourselves that Jesus will come. And that any time we meet, it will be a message of Maranatha. He is coming. Revelation 22, 17 and 20. Even so, Jesus come. He said, let the bride and the spirit keep calling people. Let him that is the testy keep coming for the rivers of living waters. Let them come and drink. Why? Because I come quickly. And the one Jesus is communicating with John would also tell Jesus, even so, Jesus, we are waiting for you. Come. We are prepared for you. One of the greatest breakthroughs that will happen to the church is when our focus is shifted and we begin to see Jesus and see him as though he is coming now, now. That we factor him in our plans and we factor him in our dreams and we factor him in the ministry. It's possible to do ministry without factoring the coming of Jesus. It's possible and it's happening now. It's possible to raise people and yet for two years not remind them that Jesus will come back again. But this is the sure word of prophecy. Look at 2 Peter 3, verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years is with the Lord a day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some people count slackness. But is long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come. Somebody say, All should come to the repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away and with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also shall, and the works that are therein shall be burnt. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversations and godliness? Verse 12. Can we all read the verse 12? One to go. Looking forward and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Looking forward. Hold on here. After he said everything that he will come as a thief and we... And the earth will melt and the things in it will melt and everything will be destroyed. And he said that now we should know what kind of people we must be in our conversation, in our godliness. And he shows us a clue. He said, looking forward. Somebody say, I'm looking forward. And hasting unto the coming of the Lord. Looking forward and hasting. In other words, in our prayer, we must be praying that Jesus come quick. We want to see you come quick. Hasting for his coming. Looking forward for his coming. This time, if you ask a believer, what are you looking forward to? He will tell you, I'm looking forward to start a business. I'm looking forward to marry. I'm looking forward for a breakthrough. I'm looking forward for that. But his, Peter says that knowing that one day Jesus will come. 
knowing that he's not slack. The only reason why he's, he's quiet and he's waiting is that people will come to repentance. He said that is the only why he's, he's waiting. And, and people say he's slack. He's not slack. He's not lazy. He's not, he's not dragging his feet. He's just waiting for more people to come. That is why the Bible says, let the spirit and the bride say come. Let them that test come. He's saying that he's just waiting for more people to come. But he's not that lazy. He's also eager to come. And all that we must be doing is that the more we cry out for people to come, we should also be looking for and hasting unto his coming. May you receive a new grace that from today, a genuine desire to see Jesus, a genuine desire to know his coming, a genuine desire to look forward and to haste him to his coming. This is what we must understand. And when you look at most of the parables, you realize that to the world he is coming with vengeance, a judge, judgment. But all his parables to the church, he referred to himself as a groom and referred the church as a bride. How can a bride not be happy for his wedding day? How can a bride not be expecting the day that we will put a ring on her hand? Are we truly a bride? To us, it is a wedding. To us, it's a marriage. And so these days, a woman can take one year to prepare a wedding. Uh, am I lying? Yeah, she, she will be dreaming about it. She will be looking for colors. She will be looking for combinations. How is going to be a garden wedding, a church wedding, a, a home engagement, and canopies, and all that. She will be planning. He says that to the church, it's not a judge that is coming. It is a groom that is coming. It is like a marriage ceremony. Am I here with the church at all? It's like a man. That is why he says that look forward for it and hasten. Hasten that it comes. His team that it comes. Do you think why did he most of the parables? He used marriage certain. He used the marriage certain. And, and our relationship with Jesus is it's marriage. It's marriage. It's a groom being espoused to his bride. You know, the tra Jewish tradition had two. Two procedures and occasions of marriage. They call, the, the first one is the betrayal. That is what Joseph and Mary were into. Joseph called Mary a wife, but he has never slept with her. Why? Because in the Jewish season, um, consummation does not happen in the first part. The first part of the marriage, what happens is that the groom comes in, pays the diary, the bride price, and then gives something they call the matan. Gives the matan a special gift to the bride. Then he lives with his father. And then his father will go and prepare the place where he and his wife will stay. So the second time will be the marriage ceremony, a supper, a, a dinner, something so nice. They will come with trumpets, blowing trumpets, and the groom will come. But that time is not in the power of the groom. It is in the power of the father of the groom. And after the father has prepared everything for the groom and his wife, then just one day he calls his son and says, son, come, we are going to pick your wife for you. Then his son, the son will just follow the father. And then they will come one day. When the bride, and after your, your bride price, and the matan or the special gift is given, the bride is expected, the woman is expected to prepare herself, and two things she must keep on her all the time is her garment and her lamb. Most of the parables Jesus gave us, it was the traditional system of the Jewish life. And that is how God is going to deal with the church and Christ. And the bride has two assignments, to keep her garment and to keep her lamb. So that if the father and the son should come at midnight, she will have a lamb to take care of them. And then the son will just go waiting for his father. And they will prepare a place. That is why John chapter 14, he said, Be not troubled. I will not leave you. I will come back again. And he said, Where I am, you will be also. For I go to prepare a place for you. For in my father's house there are many mansions. Am I here with the church at all? He promised us. That don't worry, it won't take long. If it has to do with where both of us will live, very soon my father will be done. He has many mansions. Am I here with the church at all? 
this, this were the system. And Jesus was repeating those systems to us. Just to give us comfort that I will come back, but I just don't know the time. It's in the power of the Father. That is why Jesus said that the time the Son of Man will come, no one knows. He said the Son does not know, the angels does not know, but it is in the power of the Father. That is the system. It's the Father that will one day tell the Son, we are going to pick up your bride. And the bride knows nothing about it. The groom knows nothing about it. But it will surely happen. And we see Jesus do the same thing for us on their on the arbitral day, the groom will come, pay the bride price, give a special gift, and give a wine, and they leave. And you see what? That is what Jesus did for us. The Bible said we were purchased. But the bride price in the Jewish term was a purchasing power. We were bought through his sacrifice on the cross. And then they will give a special gift to the bride. And that gift mostly is a ring, a golden ring or something. Special gift, valuable ring. And they'll put on him, the, the wife a gift. Then Jesus did not just pay our bride price. He gave us a gift. The Bible said, do not grieve the Holy Spirit through whom you are sealed even unto the day of redemption. And that seal there, the Greek meaning of that seal there means be, to be signated, signet, a ring. So through whom he, he has been given to us as a ring, a gift. And we all know that Jesus gave us a wine. On the last supper, he took the wine. He said, I do this in remembrance of me. Anytime you take the communion, remember that I'll come back for you. I'm your husband. Anytime you take the communion, remember that I've betrothed you. Anytime you take the communion, remember that somebody has paid your bride price. And you must not be the wife of any other thing. Today, live here, may you not be the wife of a demon. May you not be the wife of another man. True marriage is that between the church and Christ. This is a revelation Paul saw and decided not to marry. Because he said it in Ephesians 5. He said that all this while, we knew that the marriage between Adam and Eve was between the Christ and the church. So he saw it and said, no. Then I don't even have to marry. But see what? Even if we decide to marry, let us not let the physical marriage distract us from our marriage between us and Christ. It is when we forget this that we begin to live our lives as if we are single. No, no believer is single. You have been espoused. And you must prepare yourself as though your groom is coming for the second occasion. Revelation chapter 19, the verse number 7 downwards, he said, Behold, the marriage supper of the Lamb is ready and his bride has prepared herself. Behold. This is the mystery of our lives that we don't have to joke with. That our groom and the father is preparing. That one of these days they will come. And this Bible will just fall off. My clothes will just fall off. And I'll put on immortality. And I'll just disappear. And those who were in the church and ignored the marriage ceremony of Jesus. And was listen, there is thank you. Matthew 22. Jesus speaks of a parable of a marriage feast. Chapter 22, verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Somebody said they would not come. Verse 4. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which were bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed. All things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it. My God. This is what we are doing. We are making light of his coming. We are making light of this marriage. Between us and Jesus. It's no more something heavy for us again. We are like a bride who is not preparing for her marriage. He said they have made light of it. And went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. Go ahead. And the remnant took his servants 
and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was rough. He sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Can't we see this? Was not just a story. Can't we see? The man was not just saying fables. These things have happened. A man who made a marriage ceremony called his servants, go and fish out my friends. Bring them. And he goes and the Bible says that the friends said, we are busy. And who are his friends? I came to my own. My own did not receive me. But as many as received me. His friends were the Israelites. He came to his own. He said, we were busy. We can't believe you. And it was all a marriage ceremony. He said, we can't believe you. And he sent another servant. And you know the interesting thing? He said, I have killed my oxen and my fatlings. And the marriage is ready. And who did he kill? His son. The marriage is ready. The bride price has already been paid. It's ready. The people said, we are busy. And the worst of it is that they made light of it. And he said, I sent other servants. And they killed them. And how did they kill them? The apostles cut some into two. Burned some in fire. Made animals, lions eat some. The great tribulation. The AD 60s, the AD 70s, uh, uh, 60s and the rest. Killed them mercilessly. Killed all of them. Then he said, after they killed them, he sent his armies. That is why when Jesus was about to depart. The Bible said he looked at Jerusalem, cried over the city, and said, if you knew your visitation, if you knew your visitation, but because you don't know your visitation, he said that an army will come and destroy you and take away your women and kill your men. He was confirming this same parable to them. That when you kill my apostles, I'll kill you. My apostles will come and preach the gospel to you. They will tell you that the marriage supper is ready. They will tell you to come. But some of you will be tempted to kill them. The same way we, in this generation, we don't care to destroy pastors. We don't care to kill them. We don't care to attack them. We don't care to do that. He said that I will send my servants. They will kill them. But after they kill them, I will send my armies. And he said they will burn their city. And we, it's a history now. AD 70, after all the apostles were killed, the next thing was the AD 70 invasion of the Romans to the Jews and destroyed the whole city and burned down the temple. And today, the temple has not been built from that time to today. Only a part of it is left, the Wailing Wall. And people go there to just stand on the Wailing Wall. But this was a great temple. And it was destroyed because they killed the apostles. And the whole city was crushed. And Israel was scattered. Until I think 1948, when Britain restored them. Because of this same thing. And people came out preaching. The marriage supper is ready. The marriage is ready. The marriage is ready. But these people were not ready to go. And look at the, the next method of the Lord. After they had done all these things, they have killed his servants. And he has also destroyed them. See what he did. In the verse number... Eight. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not ready. So in other words, whether Israel is ready or not, the wedding is ready. So no matter what, somebody must be married to my son. <laughs> my son must marry, no matter what. Israel was the first wife. But they are not ready. So I must find another wife for my son. Glory to Jesus. And the verse number 9. Let's go ahead quickly, quickly. Go ye therefore into the high ways. And as many as ye find, bid to, be, to the marriage. Bid them. Let them come. Go to the high ways. Go to the high ways. In other words, go beyond this city. That was how the gospel entered into Africa, went into Europe, went beyond Asia Minor, went to every part, go into the highways, bid them to come, to come to the marriage, bid them, go into the Gentiles, preach the gospel to them, tell them the marriage is ready, tell them the sun is prepared, tell them the supper will soon be done, just tell them. 
And he says, so those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all men, as many as they found. I came to my own. My own received me not. But as many, somebody say as many, as many as received. He said, go together. All as many as you found, both bad and good. Cut that sire. Bad and good. Go. And the wedding was finished with guests. That is how come today a church can record 3,000 people. A church can record 1 million people. Papa Debo, you see sometimes more than 3 million people. He said the wedding was filled with guests because they went into the highways, whether good or bad. Oh, because you don't have to be good to be saved. So whether good or bad, it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter your tradition, it doesn't matter your language, it doesn't matter your culture. All there is is that you are ready to come. That is why when we go out there to bring them, we don't check their figure, we don't check the work they do, we don't check their financial background. Whether good or bad, come. 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 We don't check who you are. We are not going for beautiful people. Ugly, beautiful, good in grammar, not good in grammar. We are going for everyone. Just come. Just come. Just come. And he said, the wedding, <laughs> the wedding was filled and finished with guests. Everybody was happy. Somebody said, we're happy. Are we not filled? Is this place not filled? We are filled. You go to every church, the place is filled. Filled with guests. Filled with guests. And when the king came, remember the wedding was for the son of the king. But it's the king that will come. I told you in the tradition, the coming of the groom, you see it with the father coming. He said, but when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. I thought you said, whether good or bad, we can come. Yes. But this is the system of God. Come as you are, but don't remain as you are. Don't remain as you came. Come as you are, but don't remain as you came. You can come. Whether good, come. Whether bad, come. You must come. But when you come, Europeans, Nigerians, Ghanaians, Togolese, Burkina Faso, Benin, South Africans, Kenyans, just come. Americans, come. 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 But your coming doesn't change the principle of the king. Come. Come. His standards are sure. Come as you are. But when you come into the wedding, there are rules of the wedding. Just come. All you need to do is to have a humble heart. Just come. When you come into the wedding, follow the, the rules. But there was a man. When many came and the room was filled, there was someone who was comfortably seated. And he could see that this was my friend when we were at the highways. We were all bad. But this, my friend, entered the wedding room and he has changed into the marriage garment. He turns, this was my relative. He has changed. And I'm sure some of the servants that brought them will go to this young man and tell this young man that it's good you came but you cannot remain like this you have to change change into the marriage garment change into the wedding garment your character your behavior your sin couldn't stop you from coming but as you have come you have to put on the garment of the wedding and this young man will turn and tell them that i only came to eat i did not come to conform to the systems of this wedding. I came here because the, 
the feast is ongoing. The bounties of the, of the king is here. The drinks of the king is here. And all that is all I came for. I didn't come to conform to his rules. I didn't come to conform to the system. I came to be my own, but to enjoy. That's what we are doing today. Pastor, pray for me for a breakthrough. But I'm not ready to walk with the Lord. I'm not ready. I'm here, but I'm not of this place. No, I've come with my legs, but my heart is not here. And this young man came in, and he saw everybody in a wedding garment, but only him, he chose to be like the way he is. And when the king entered, these were many. But the first person he saw was the one who didn't look like his true wedded to Christ. Oh, what will the wedding garment be? I believe that many theologians have their own ideas. But Jesus put it there. So that, that means clearly that he has more than one idea about the wedding garment he was speaking of. He had more than one idea about it. So we cannot point that it's one thing. But we know that when you come among the wedding setting, there must be a garment clothing you. And that garment might be the righteousness of Christ himself. That when you come in, you must accept the righteousness of God. That through Christ, I am saved. That he paid the penalty on the cross. Yes. The moment you put on Christ, you are preparing yourself as a real participant of the wedding. And you look up to him for your perfection. Look up to him for your, for your righteousness. Put up to him for your justification. And the wedding garment also can be the working of the Holy Spirit in us, in all sorts of sanctification. Oh, when you come to the understanding that Christ is your righteousness and you have been renewed in spirit and his nature is in you then the next thing is holiness so that wedding coming can also be holiness that is the outward expression of that inner transformation the outward expression the character you bring out because Jesus lives in you am I here with the church at all? he said that this man refused he refused this garment, he refused it. This man refused it. So he was there. When we pray and say receive it, he receives it. But he's not ready to walk in the righteousness of Christ. When we say that today is a service of breakthrough service, he will come. And eventually he will have a miracle. But the truth of the matter is that the nature of Christ in him was not reflected. He was of his, same, his, his self will. He was self dependent. What he wanted is what he does. He is not under the rulership and the dictatorship of the Holy Spirit. He is not led by the Spirit. As many as are led by the Spirit, they are the children of God. This person was in the world then, but of his own. Nobody controls him. The word of God has lost power in before this person. The Holy Spirit cannot control this person. He was on his own garment altogether. He was not a submissive bride of the Lamb. Oh, we see that. Putting on the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Yes, we know them. All they want to say is that you told me to come, I've come. I've come and so what? Leave me to do what I want. The young man came all right. But he was not different from the ones who said I won't come. He was not different. It's better to say I won't come than to come. And not be prepared as a bride to the groom. It's better to say I won't come. But to sit among us. And not be in line. Oh, people of God, let me tell you of a truth. Of this truth. It's not enough to be in church. It's not enough to be a member of a church. It's not enough to fill forms. It's not enough to pay tight. It's not enough to give offerings. Until your heart 
is given to this groom and you are waiting for him and you are not just in the wedding place just drinking and eating because the king will come and will you be in your wedding garment and Jesus has to tell us a whole parable only on the lamp about the ten virgins that we should have extra oil beside us. Then he tells us another whole parable about the garment. These two. How we must put on this garment and prepare. He says that for the marriage supper of the groom has come. And he said, for the saints wash their lining in the blood. They wash. Revelation 19, 7 to 9. They wash. And he said, they make it white in the blood. They make it white. And he said, the king said unto him, friend, how comest thou? in Hida, not having a wedding garment. Who convinced you? Who assured you? Who really told you this is accepted? To sit here without a garment. To behave as if nothing is at stake. Who really encouraged you that you can be in church and just be a church goer? He said, friend, how come? And he said, and he was speechless. For he, the Bible to record he was speechless means before the king came he was speech full they are the people that talk they are the people that criticize they are the people that go all out me i can do what i want i can do what i want they are the people in church who tells you that if you don't keep quiet as a pastor i will stop the church just allow me to be in and they are the ones that will quickly tell you. If you tell them, work on your wedding garment, he will tell you, don't judge me. Hey! The Bible says that for the spiritual man is judge of no one, but he can judge all things and judge all people. When we meet as spiritual men, we can judge ourselves. So if you are going down, allow me to tell you. If I'm going down, I must allow you to tell me. If I'm staining my garment, I must allow you to tell me. Oh, if you are staining your garment, you must allow me to tell you. Don't put fear in me to a point that I must shut up my mouth. Don't, no, may I not put fear in you? Yesterday, a man of God wanted to speak to me. He came to me, was talking to me, and he was scared to tell me what God is really telling him. And I saw how long he took him. And before he would say anything, I knelt down. I said, tell me. Tell me. Don't put fear. In people, allow you may not be in preparation. It is a man, it's another one. Don't wait for the king to come and ask you, Where is your garment? Where is your lamp? Where is your oil? Where, Where is We can be boastful, but not in his presence. We can be boastful. Before men, we can judge ourselves by our status so much that men cannot talk about us. But the king has no respect for flesh and blood. The king has no respect. Friend! You are a friend because I killed a fatling for you. And I brought you into the wedding garment. But you are an enemy because you refused to be transformed. Nobody can argue God. Nobody can stand God. Peter said that his judgment will begin in his house. 
when the guests are full and then he singles some out and say why are you here why did you walk in your own will your own selfishness why didn't you submit to my will you were among those who praise me with their lips but their hearts are far away were part of them and the explanations we have been given to our parents explanations we have been given to our pastors explanations we have been given to people we revere we will stand before the king and our tongue will cliff to our mouth we can't talk anymore no excuse on the other day in Mark 8 he said that he that will be ashamed of me before this perverse and adulterous generation, I will be ashamed of him when I come in the glory of my father with his angels. He said, I'll be ashamed of him. People of God, we have not known shame. We have not known shame. No, no, poverty is not shame. Failing in school is not shame. Not succeeding in ministry is not shame. There is a shame coming up like a flood. When the king will stand and ask, Why are you not in your wedding garment? And he said, That day he will be ashamed of us. It is on that day we will look at his eyes, eyeball to eyeball, and we will not see the picture we see on, 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 on our walls that is Jesus. No, that is an actor somewhere. Jesus is all in all. The Father is all in all. Everything has a part in him. On that day when we see his eyes, we will see his eyes as the one that we should have loved, that we never loved. We will see in his eyes others. We will see in his eyes others. The people he told us to visit, we never visited. The people he told us to give to, we never gave to. Oh, we will see in his eyes. The people we committed abortion with when we were destroying their souls but never cared. We will see in his eyes. On that day when you lose eyeball to eyeball, we will know what shame is. Because we have been hiding so many things in our lives. So we don't even know what it is. But that day when we look into his eyes, we will know the danger of defrauding people in the name of Jesus. We will know. We will know. We will see it so clear. Oh. Oh. I pray that before the king comes, may we encounter him even before that we may know how to wash our garment and make it white in his blood. And make it white in his blood. There is something about God. When he looks eyeball to eyeball with you, something happens to you. Isaiah saw his glory. He said, Woe unto me, for I am undone. I dwell among a people with uncleanness, and I have an uncleanness. Isaiah probably never knew until he saw himself in the mirror of God's light. Zacchaeus had an encounter, saw the eyes of Jesus, was convicted. He said, ah, if I have defrauded someone, hey, I give a double. You can't have an encounter with him and we, uh, continually make your garment stained. No, it's not possible. Adam, Adam, where are you? He said, I'm naked. He said, who told you that you are naked? Adam said, no one told me. But when I saw you, I saw myself. I saw I've messed up. I saw it. Oh, if you continue to look at the pastor, you will never see you are wrong. 
If you continue to look at other church members, you'll never see that you are wrong. If you continue to make men your idols, you'll never see that you are wrong. But the day you have an encounter with the Spirit of Christ, you will see yourself. And it's better to know yourself through the eyes of the Spirit here on earth than to wait for the coming of the King. That time there is no chance. There is no chance. There will be no chance for anyone. You can't even explain. He says, and the man was speechless. There is the blessing of grace. And there is the rule of grace. Paul's lecture to Titus. He says that for the grace of God that teaches us to walk in godliness, there is a rule. We are preparing. And some of us, when he come to meet us in the wedding day, he will look into our eyes and say, Thou good and faithful servant. You were in the highway. I brought you in. And you have really prepared yourself for the wedding. Thou good and faithful servant. There are some you will look at them and say, Thou good but unfaithful. In the wedding hall, you were a good preacher, but unfaithful with the finances of the church. You were a good singer, but unfaithful in, in giving the glory to Jesus. You were a good leader, chapel head, but you were unfaithful with the ladies in the church. Thou good and unfaithful. Expect in many things but never faithful with how God wanted you to do it. And there are some to that are faithful, but not good enough. You won't miss church, but you are not good enough to help with the advancement of the church. You are faithful to say, I'm a member of Grace Mount. I'm a member of the kingdom. I am in the wedding coming, in the wedding hall. I'm there, but you are not faithful enough to encourage others. You are not faithful enough to visit others. You are not faithful enough to intercede so that others will stand. You are not faithful enough. That some of you, you are good in business, good in finances, good in that, good in that, but you are not faithful enough to bless the kingdom with it. And many times you go to a church and only few are really supporting the church. Only few. And it's not that they don't have what it takes. They are only unfaithful. And on that day, he will look into our eyes and he will tell some, you are good and you are faithful. He will tell some, you were good but unfaithful. He will tell some, you are unfaithful but you are good. And look at what happened to the boy when he became speechless. He said, he called other servants and told them, bind him hand and foot. Bind him. This was a young man who wanted liberty, even in my wedding hall. Bind him. He was looking for liberality. Whatever I want, I can do. Bind him. Cut the score for harder. He was not outside, he was inside. But he chose to wear what he wanted. Bind him. You don't want to be controlled by the spirit, you'll be controlled by chains. Maranatha. Jesus is coming. After all is said and done, let the church remember that the owner, the owner, Oh, in his presence, titles will fail. Head pastorship will fail. In his presence, shepherds will fail. The ground before the judgment seat of the king will be a level ground. Everybody will be of the same. 
And Peter said that knowing that these things in this world and the elements of this world will melt away, you should know how your conversation should be in all godliness. And he said, looking forward to and hastening to the day of the Lord. Looking forward that our conversation will be that Jesus will soon come. Oh, it's been 2,020 years, but we still know he will come. For a thousand years, it's like a day. And a day, it's like a thousand. He will come. And our job is to keep preparing our garments and burning more lamb, burning more lamb, putting in more oil, putting in more oil. That is why we come to church to stir up ourselves in prayer, in the word. When you receive the word, it's an oil you are receiving. When faith comes, it's an oil. When love comes, it's an oil. When encouragement comes, it's an oil. We keep burning the lamb. He will come. As a thief in the night, he will come. It will come in a twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, he said that he will come. And the dead in Christ will rise. We will see things burn off in our very eyes. Is this not the thing I didn't sleep to greet? Is this not the thing that took my, my sleep away, took my rest away, took my strength away, and is burning in fire? Yes. He will come and that will be the results of his coming if you don't want to believe anything believe in the parables of jesus that speaks of the coming of the king he will come back again he'll come back again and he will bind hand and foot those who are outside the wedding hall and those who are inside and are not in the wedding garment go yourself the wedding garment is anything that attend to our salvation everything one thing about the jewish wedding is that you must make sure that when you get there you put on the wedding garment that the, the groom will supply and Jesus has supplied wedding garment he said put on Christ as clothes and he said for Christ has become your wisdom your sanctification your redemption and your righteousness he has become so anytime you say I put on Christ there must be an expression of sanctification in you there must be an expression of wisdom in you to show that indeed you are in the garment rise up on your feet Thank you for watching. To have access to this message and many others, subscribe to our YouTube page and get unlimited access to messages. Hallelujah, beloved. God bless you for watching this episode. I believe that God has tremendously blessed your life with this words of eternal life. But before I leave you, there is an important thing that I need to do with you. I believe that God has blessed you. You have so much. But there is something that regardless of what you have, if your life is lacking it, you are going nowhere. And that thing is the salvation through Christ Jesus. I believe that the people of old, Abraham, Moses, um, Isaac, Noah, they saw so much glory in their lives. But there was one thing that made them incomplete because they couldn't be saved from their sins. And therefore God, loving the whole world, brought his only begotten son that his son would die on the cross and anyone that believed that he died and rose up shall be saved the bible says the righteousness of god that is without the law for the law and the prophets only witnessed of this righteousness the true righteousness is not in the law it's in one man the bible says that even the righteousness which is by faith in jesus that has come unto all and upon all this is a righteousness that doesn't check your background it doesn't check your color it doesn't check your language if only you can believe in this one man Jesus you will be justified and you will be sanctified unto the Lord and I came to introduce this one man to you that there is one thing you cannot do for yourself that is to pay for your sins someone else has paid it on the cross he died on the cross and resurrected unto our justification and today I want to introduce you to him if you may and you are thinking of your eternal life right now you want to say this after me say Lord Jesus I believe that you died for my sins and you resurrected for my justification thank you for doing that for me I know that all my sins were put on you on the cross and I believe it and believe it with all my heart thank you Lord I thank you that you have taken my sins right now that I confess you that you are my Lord and personal Savior thank you for taking away my sins and I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus I am blessed and I'm highly favored 
thank you lord jesus for dying for me god bless you for making this confession but beloved it's important to know that you must be a part of a church for your proper development in christ jesus and for discipleship and therefore, I extend a hand of invitation to you to this wonderful family of Christ called Grace Mountain Ministry for counseling, for prayer, for the study of the Word of God. I believe that every Christian must grow into the measure of the fullness of Christ. And that is why there is a need to be part of these wonderful services we have every weekend. Fridays and Sundays. And please check the details. Call us and wish to be part of it. Come and be blessed end of every month also we have seven days of consecration before the lord in fasting and in prayer and that one also wherever you are i invite you to come the lord is blessing lives the lord is turning lives around the lord is transforming people in discipleship and you want to be here you need to know the lord you need to grow in him come and let's have fellowship together and the lord will richly bless you and bless your family god bless you i will see you next Sunday, I'm expecting to see you and I'll welcome you and personally talk with you. God, which He bless you. Take care of yourself till we meet again on this broadcast. Bye-bye.